It's The Currents, and it's Jim McGuinn with Tommy Stinson. How are you, my friend? Good. Good morning. Good. Yeah, good morning. Uh, Tommy from The Replacements, Guns N' Roses, Perfect, Bash and Pop. I know I'm missing more. Soul Asylum. Soul Asylum, of course. Yes. And a um, Minnesota native. Not living here anymore, but a native to to here. And uh, today we're chatting because it's hard to believe, but uh, this is the 40th anniversary of the release of Sorry Ma, Forgot to Take Out the Trash, the debut album from The Replacements. And I can't even imagine what it's like for you to hit a milestone like that. Uh, it's, a, it's a little funny. I haven't really given it all that much thought, except that Bob Mayer called me up. Ask me if, uh, if if my mom or my sisters would take part in doing a walk through the house on Twenty Second and Bryant <laughs> for some <laughs> cute um, virtual thing of some sort. I thought that was kind of funny. It was like, well, that's weird. Yeah, so, yeah forty years ago today. Forty years. I mean, you were what fourteen, fifteen when that when that record first came out. Well, let's see. Yeah, now it put me at about 14 and a half, 15 years old. Wow. What's uh I mean, it's the first record you made, obviously. You were uh-huh. you're you're a kid and what what are your memories of even being in the studio at that time and making the first replacements album? It was weird. I mean, you you, you kind of you know, on the one hand, you think, "Wow, we've actually made it. We're in a studio recording." Woohoo! And, and all that. You get all that kind of excitement, and then you kind of go it sounds crazy in here. It's nothing like, you know, like when you're sitting in front of your amps in the basement, you know, and everything's loud and you can, you're used to a certain thing. Uh, it took a little adjusting to get to the studio, to get used to the studio way of doing things and that it was so much different than, um, you know, than playing live or, you know, rehearsing in the basement. Yeah. That was the first thing that kind of pops into my mind. And, and how long had you been even playing bass by that point when you guys were going in the studio for that record i guess it must have been about four years i think i started i think bob you know basically started showing me how to play when i was 11 okay we just come back home from being gone for a spell um yeah so it must have been about four years or something yeah because there's some really, I mean, there's some really fluid bass lines for, I, I can't even imagine being, you know, 14 and coming up with those lines and then, and then, you know, knocking them down in the studio. Did you guys, do you remember, did you guys, did, were those tracks, were they played live? Like, were you all playing together or was it tracked like, a, a, you know, more modern albums are done now where it's sort of instrument yeah, at a time? All that stuff was completely live. I think the only thing that ended up getting overdubbed at any point was some of the vocals. And I'm not mm-hmm. even sure all the vocals were overdubbed, to be honest with you. I think some of them are pretty much just as they were. Yeah. You know? um, but I know there was a few overdubs here and there. But, um, yeah, that's that was like just, okay, hit it and run. Yeah, in a, in a room, just kind of bashing it out. And um, yeah. were you guys, do you remember, were you guys like, you know, you know, facing each other or was Paul in a control room because he was singing or was there isolation at all or was it just, it, just it was so set it up and go? There were like there was like a like a one room in the corner that was like an isolation booth kind of thing, and the rest of it we were kind of just in a room, you know, with gobos between us kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, not not completely isolated, um, in that way. Yeah. Who who came up with the uh, the album title? Sorry, Ma, I forgot to take out the trash. Where did that come from? You know. <laughs> Um, I want to say it came off a note that we had to leave because we had a gig or something. And I, you know, <laughs> one of us, sorry, sorry, but I've got to go to the trash because it was, you know, I know it was one of my responsibilities at one point, um, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. It's, uh, it, it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's become, uh, you know, sort of a iconic album in some ways just to, to capture an attitude of, of, of youth and, even there early on, I mean, later Paul would write Tommy Gets His Tonsils Out, but but right there at the top, you know, I hate music, too many notes, Tommy says so. You know, was that weird for you to be like written into the songs that you guys were uh, were, were writing? No, you know, not really. I mean, 
we were working with what was in front of us. And I think to, you know, to Paul's credit, you know, I, I would think at that point he was fairly prolific. I mean, yeah. For, you know, I don't know what exactly was getting him going, except the idea that maybe we might get out of the basement and get into the clubs at some point and maybe make a record, that kind of thing. But, um, you know, he, he, we, there was a lot of stuff. I mean, that record had more songs and more outtakes and things like that than probably every record after it because of how busy we got. Yeah. And stuff. I mean, we really kind of hit the, hit the floor running. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a tons of songs on the record, but then there's demos, there's outtakes, there's songs that never, never came out, and and uh, I know on the box set there's a, a a live show from Seventh Street Entry from from that era as well, and I want to say there's 27 tracks on the on the set. I mean, you guys you guys ripped through your sets back in those days. Yeah, well, each song was about two minutes long at best. <laughs> <laughs> So do you remember when the when the record was done and you know this is the anniversary of it coming out was there a was there a gig at that time or was there an in store or anything that do you remember anything about that that time when the album actually like hit the record store that you experienced or or, or... not really you know I don't um, I don't remember exactly I mean I must I would I would assume and I can't probably remember at the moment that we did it at Warfolk probably. Yeah. Um, uh, and it could very well have fallen on a school night for me. Right. Because um, I was still going to school then. Yeah. So one of those things that <laughs> I got to swing by for a little while before it was time to go to bed, you know? Yeah. God, I can't even, I can't even imagine what it'd be like to uh, have a record like that and a couple of records while you're, you know, still in high school. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah, I mean, showing up to class in the morning after playing the the entry the night before was quite a trip. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you were watching Happy Days. I was, uh, you know, playing the Seventh Street entry last night. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God! So the box set is uh, is coming in uh, in October. I mean, it's have you have you. Do you spend much time on these collections? Like, do you go through and listen to a lot of the outtakes and the extra stuff? Or is it kind of a shock to you when the, when the records come out? You know, I'll be honest with you. I don't listen to them. Uh, I, I, I'm cool with the content and I'm cool with the people that have put it together because I trust them implicitly. I mean, yeah. I've known Peter for 42 years or so now. I trust him with my life, you know, and I, um, you know, Bob Mayer, another one. I mean, I, I don't know if I trust him with my life exactly, but um, I do trust his taste. And, his, you know, he's done a good job by us with the with the book, I think. Uh, and I, you know, for all practical purposes, you know, if there's, you know, uh, I still travel around a lot and do shows and have been all over the world. And what is still remarkable to me and why I'm cool with these things so much is that we are, it's funny how relevant we still seem to be amongst a lot of young. I mean, I, I meet kids that are like their parents had turned them on to us and they're now just like going into that era of rock in a way they, you know, without, they wouldn't have gone into and, and under and checked out whether it was us, who's could do or, you know, anything else. So I think there's, there's a, there's kind of a funny relevancy to it that, it's inspiring. It's and it's to me. It's sort of like that's cool, you know. It's it's you know nothing to scoff at, you know. So why not? Why not give give them you know give them some extra bits that they might you know they might learn something from or get some insight into the makings of the beast. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you know, you you may have had no idea at the time, but it zero it's, idea. It's it's, it's the kind of record that is like a blueprint, you know, if not a blueprint for life, it's a blueprint for garage bands that are getting started and have a lot of ideas and, and want to express them. You know, there's a lot going on on that record, Fast and Furious. Yeah. I mean, we, we did everything. I mean, everything we did, we kind of, you know, we worked at to a degree, but a lot of stuff, I mean, we're, like I said, Paul was fairly prolific. So, you know, we didn't spend a whole lot of time hacking things up before we got, you know, before we sort of solidified them in a way. The only yeah. wild card, the only real wild card for the most part 
as far as differentiation and stuff that like that would be my brother's guitar playing um he had a way of kind of coming and going you know in the songs that was uniquely him you know yeah and was was Bob's playing? Was it sort of different every time? Like uh, you know, like what? Like you know, usually a band you kind of hardwire the parts together, right? But yeah. but you get the sense that Bob take one and take three could be so radically different. You got it exactly right. I mean, he <laughs> um, he more played around with the parts than playing the parts, and that mm. was kind of the magic of him in a way. Yeah, I think at times I think him and Paul might have you know, you know, not seeing eye to eye and maybe butted heads a bit on, on that. I think it was a bit of a, a power struggle between the two of them as far as I could tell in a lot of ways. And um, at the end of the day, you know, we get what we get, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and a lot of times that would be great. I mean, so you... great. my brother was a great guitar player, so he, he had a lot to offer if he was willing to offer that was more the uh that was more where the uh the trickery became came into play yeah i mean he seems like he was the uh the intangible that that could really you know push the stew in a lot of directions depending oh. on where he was at at the moment exactly um you recently kind of helped celebrate your late brother Bob Stinson's legacy with uh, an event at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame around his old organ, right? Yeah, it was his kidney. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 um, it sounds so funny to say that uh, that we played with his organ because it wasn't his main instrument. <laughs> but um, you know, this thing had been sitting in my mom's basement after he passed for a while, and then. My mom, they wanted to refinish the basement because it was leaking and stuff like this. So it sat in Soul Asylum's storage space for the better part of 20 years, and they mm -hmm. needed to get rid of it. And one guy we know um, that I know or met um, wanted it first. I put it, it would put an ad out like on the internet. Hey, Bob's Oregon, you know, that was in, come get it if you want it because it takes four guys to move. Mm -hmm. um, it's an old Wurlitzer from the 40s, I think. And then the Hall of Fame wanted it. So then I had to call the first guy and say, hey, you know, Hall of Fame called and said they want this thing and it'd make my mom happy if it went there. How do you feel about letting them take it instead of you take it? And you know, it's like, well, I'd be a jerk if I didn't let them take it and put it up there and make your mom happy. So yeah, um, so yeah they came and picked it up. They refurbished it. We played a gig last Friday. Uh, my, my group, uh, Cowboys on the Campfire, it's a duo, me and Chip Roberts. And um, we just went up and uh, had my uh, other buddy, Tony Corraldo, who plays keys and, and piano and stuff like this. He came up and played the last part of our set on it, uh, on our, the last part of our set. And it was fun. Yeah. My mom showed up and everyone had fun. And I came home and got COVID again. Just Sorry to hear that. Can't beat the odds on that one. Yeah, uh, that's one thing, Tommy. You and I share. We're both breakthrough COVID cases. I this know. Month. Isn't that a pisser? <laughs> it's crazy. Um, so, provided you recover, which we are hopeful, and you do seem like you're on the road to recovery. Yeah. What's uh? I think I have a head cold. I'm to know yeah. Me. What's are, are you uh, are you going to be playing some shows then in this fall? And is that uh, what's coming up next? Or you got uh, something on the horizon? Yeah, you know, I got a couple of things scattered about now. Um, I'm half thinking of coming back to the Minneapolis area and doing a Midwest run with, with uh, Cowboys and Campfire before it starts to get too crazy out there. Yeah. Um, if I were to do that, I'm looking at sort of the, the end of October kind of area. Okay. Uh, I got a date being held for me right now at the Turf Club um, if, I, if that should work out. So... We'll see. Um, yeah. You know, like you said, if, if I don't croak before. <laughs> I don't well, hopefully, we'll, hopefully, we'll hopefully we'll see you soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's what I'm planning on. And we got, and the Cowboys and Campfire Records, hopefully we'll come up for the end of the year yeah. um, with, with singles before it actually drops. So that kind of, hopefully we'll uh, hook all that together and play the shows around the Midwest there to kind of start supporting that. Cool. 
Cool. Well, we'll we'll look forward to seeing seeing you there. And uh, it's Tommy Stinson from, well, from the Replacements, Guns N' Roses, a lot of other bands. But um, before you go, I want to ask one more thing about Sorry Ma, this album we're celebrating today on its uh, 40th anniversary. Do you have a favorite song from that record? Is there one song that you go, oh yeah, that's the one we we <laughs> nailed, or that's the one we didn't nail, or whatever? It's funny you should ask that. I was thinking about it last night because I knew we were going to talk. I think Customer might be it. All right. Um, Bob's solo on it is just so nuts and, and so magical. And, and, and the whole song is, I mean, the song is kind of funny in a way, but, you know, it's just, just whipping through. But um, no, I always just let, thought Bob's solo on that was just bananas and great. Yeah. And I, I, I remember, you know, I remember all of us just going, what? You know, is that, did that really happen? <laughs> uh thank you for joining us here it is the uh, 40th anniversary of the release of sorry ma forgot to take out the trash the replacements tommy stinson bass player friend extraordinaire and uh covid survivor let's say yeah hell yeah come on yeah <laughs>